First of all, I want to thank Rob for leading those wonderful hymns. We truly have a wonderful, masterful God who created the heavens and the earth. And we're here today to worship God in spirit and truth. It's so good for us to be together to worship our wonderful creator who has given us so many blessings for us to enjoy and especially our eternal salvation, hope of heaven. And so it's good to see all that's present. And our visitors, you're welcome and warmly welcome to even have some from West Virginia. So that's great. Glad you can be with us and study God's word together. Well, look, I'm filling in for Kyle here this morning. That's obvious, right? And lo and behold, I look out there and I see Kyle and I said, what in the world? Why isn't he preaching? He's the preacher here. And uh, yet it's given him some time to prepare for an upcoming vacation. And also he's busy packing as he's uh, selling his home. So hopefully we can give him some needed relief. So listen, if I bomb the lesson and it doesn't turn out, you can say, hey, he's not the regular speaker. So may that be a relief to you all. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I want to begin by... First of all, saying that this lesson was especially chosen uh, as I taught the teenage class uh, a month ago or so, a couple of months ago, and, and was talking to them about evolution and how unscientific evolution is. And they said, would you preach that lesson for us if you get the chance? And so really it's designed for them. However, it's really also something important for uh, teachers, parents, grandparents, for you to know some of these things and be kind of grounded in these facts because we're fed this idea that evolution is a fact and we're going to see that it is not a fact at all. So in order to begin the lesson, I want to read some statements from the evolutionist, which I believe will set the stage, and that is that evolution is not a scientific fact, even though they're telling us it is. And so, first of all, this quote from the American Humanist Association in January of 77, the humanist paper said this. It was a statement affirming evolution as a principle of science. This single page do document went on to say, for many years it has been well established scientifically that all known life forms uh, including human beings, have developed by a lengthy process of evolution. It goes on to say, evolution is the only presently known, listen, strictly scientific and non-religious explanation for the existence and the diversity of living organisms. Another paper called the American Geological Institute stated, it reads, Scientific evidence indicates beyond any doubt that life has existed on Earth for billions of years. Although scientists debate the mechanism that produced this change, the evidence for the change is undeniable. Therefore, in the teaching of science, we oppose any position that ignores this scientific reality. Another paper called the American Association for the Advancement of Science says, whereas the association respects the right of people to hold diverse beliefs about creation that do not come within the definition of science, creationist groups are actually imposing their beliefs disguised as science to the detriment and distortion of public education in the United States and really, that's exactly opposite of what we're doing, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're saying that we have the science, that they're the ones then that are saying it's science, it's science, it's science. And so these statements, I want to say, they emphatically are saying that evolution is fact. It's an established reality. It's a proven fact. They boldly claim that we have scientifically proven that evolution is true. Now, to these statements, I boldly proclaim 
that I disagree with that totally and will plainly say at the very offset that evolution is not a scientific fact or reality. And so the statement we have read are lies, disguising evolution as science. And so the aim of this lesson is to prove that evolution is not based on science at all, and not only that, and if I, where'd the uh, thing go here that changes everything? Do I just use the arrow keys? Okay. And not only that, but evolution is even, listen, unscientific. In fact, it violates credible, established laws of science that are in the books today. It's actually contrary, then, to known laws of science. Now, the general theory of evolution is completely unscientific. We'll expose it as a giant fraud, a formulation of guesswork, it's, it's an improvable fable, and it's a distortion with false evidence. Evolution is a fallacy if there ever was one, and our young children are being duped to believe this unscientific thing. And so the Bible even says in 1 Timothy 6, Paul wrote uh, Timothy and said, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust and avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. It's as if he's speaking to our generation. They say it's science, but it's falsely so called. Another translation of this said in the New King James Version, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoid profane and vain babblings and contradiction, contradictions of that which is falsely called knowledge. And so they call it science. They call it knowledge, when in fact it is falsely so named. And I want us to remember that verse. Well, let me begin by defining some terms uh, that I'll be referring to in the lesson. We must have a correct understanding of these things as we get along in the lesson. Because the term evolution in its simplest meaning, the word evolution itself is not a bad word. The word evolution, we sometimes say things evolve. Things evolve in our life, right? It simply means change or to develop gradually. And so we could use the word in its proper context as we grow old, we change. If you were to look at pictures of me when I was a boy, and then pictures of me now, you say, is that the same person? Yes, it is. I've kind of evolved as I've gotten older and I've gotten grayer and, and so forth, right? So we evolve just simply that way. We could talk about the process of milk. We have cows in the pasture. We bring them in, we milk them. Then we put them in containers and then the milk in containers. And then we send it away to have it pasteurized. Eventually, it's put into milk cartons, and it's taken to our store and sold on a shelf. We could say that's the evolution of how we get milk. We get the milk from the cow, but it comes through pasteurization, etc. We could talk about the evolving or evolution of a bill, a legislative bill, as that bill is drawn up, and then it goes to the Senate. The Senate looks at that bill, and they start examining They start changing it. The bill evolves... And eventually it's refined, and then we have the final bill that the president would sign. So in this sense, the word evolution is not wrong. We talk about that in our everyday language. But in the field of science, the word evolution is used in two respects. And the first respect is special, or what we call specific or microevolution. And we must understand this distinguishment because we're not against that. And this is within a kind we change. So we have within the human race, within the human kind or species, we have blacks or whites. We have people from uh, Chinese people. We, we've changed. We, we have different colored eyes. We have different colored hair. We have different features and complexions. And so there is notably and no doubt change within a kind, 
But nothing more than that. Change within a kind. We have all different uh, examples of dogs. Dogs, and there's change within dogs, you know. We have a greyhound dog. We have a little poodle. We have different kinds. Uh, we sometimes say kinds, but it's one kind. It's a dog species, but there's a change within that species. Frogs, we have all different examples of change within frogs and different colors, and, and that's just change within a kind. Horses, we have some small little horses, pony ho ponies, and then all the way up to giant quarter horses, or even those huge horses, right? Those massive horses. That's all change within a kind, and we do that. And, and that's not changing from one kind to another kind at all. But what we're talking about and what we're against is called the general or broad or macro theory of evolution. And that is a change from one kind to another. In other words, as we see at the bottom of the screen, that all life forms have evolved from a single cell blob or organism or whatever it is, gases or mass or whatever they want to come up with, they think that that somehow spontaneously generated to life and intelligent and all those things. So I want to read a statement regarding that. The theory of evolution may be defined as the hypothesis that millions of years ago, lifeless matter acted upon by natural forces gave origin to one or more organisms which have since evolved into all living and extinct plants and animals, including man. That's what we're opposing. It's the general theory of evolution that we'll be refuting as unscientific and without any evidence, it's false. It's the general theory of evolution that we have evolved from a single-celled organism, from the simplest to the most complex, by a constant changing or evolving. That invertebrates were the ancestors and gave rise to vertebrates, or spined creatures. That fish were the ancestors and gave rise to amphibians, those creatures that live on land or in water. That amphibians gave rise to mammals, and eventually the finished product is man. And so as they say, we evolved from a monkey, that we came from a monkey. Let me begin reading again at another uh, point that is, um, oh no, I've already read that. Uh, how, let me say, how did evolution come about. Why did it begin in the first place? It's relatively recent, isn't it? Darwin and so forth. Well, let me say that evolution did not come first and then atheism. Atheism came first. And then humanism. And man wanting to be the highest life form and responsible to no one or no creator. They didn't want to be accountable to anyone. Therefore, man sought out to explain the origin of the universe by some other means other than God. To free men from God, this God we just sang about, the creator, and from our accountability to God. And so evolution was born, and evolution is the brain child of atheism. That's the bottom line. So as we get to the heart of the lesson, we must define the understanding of science. What is science, really? What is it? If they're saying that evolution is scientific, then what is science? So it's most important that we know the process of determining scientific law. And so my first denial of evolution as unscientific, and we're going to see this in a second, is that it rests upon the scientific method. And I'm going to prove it to be unscientific because it does not fall within the definition of science. Now let me read what science is from this uh, paper. It says, in arriving at a scientific law, there are three main steps. The first consists in observing the significant facts. The second is arriving at a hypothesis 
which, if it is true, would account for these facts. The third is deducing from this hypothesis the consequences which can be tested by observation. If the consequences are verified, the hypothesis is provisionally accepted as true, although it will usually require modification later. So, let me read another statement of arriving at scientific fact. The scientific method involves six steps. The statement of the problem, the collection of the information by observation, which bears on the problem. The formation of an explanation or hypothesis which one thinks might solve the problem and deducing from the hypothesis which what, what one believes will follow if the hypothesis is true. As Simpson worded it, predictions of other observable, observable phenomena are deduced from the hypothesis and then testing the hypothesis to see whether the predicted phenomenon occurs or does not occur. And the hypothesis is accepted, modified, or rejected, listen, in accordance with the degree of fulfillment of the prediction. And so simply stated, look at the bottom here. It's, it's just identifying the problem, assembling the data, forming the theory, and then you have to test it and see whether it's come so. If it comes so, then that's acceptable science. But folks, science is not a field of thought. It's not what you think may have happened or what you may wish had happened or what you want to happen, which that's what the evolutionist wishes and wants and hopes and all that. But true science is the observable. It's what you can test and see, and then you know because you've observed it. That's what true science is. H.A. Ironside said, science means exact knowledge. To call such a name the wild guesses of the evolutionist and infidel biologist is but word prostitution. Before we go any further in the lesson, you know, actually, I'm kind of proud to stand up here and defend science for what it really is. Because I'm not raising an attack against science. The truth of the matter is I'm defending science. I'm defending and upholding science for what it truly is. And that is the observable and the tested. I am for real science, you see. I want to defend science from the fraud and imposter evolution that is pseudoscience. It's not science at all. And why do I say that? I say that because, listen, evolution cannot be tested or observed, especially the beginning of the universe. It can't be tested or observed. No scientist can experiment with the origin of the world because it is outside the realm of science. Science deals with material and physical properties in the observable. However, with the origin of the world, you cannot assemble the materials. No one was there, the materials are unknown, and the conditions are unknown. And so it's outside the realm of science, which is observable evidence. Not only that, but to make it even more clear, science, you see, cannot uh, experiment in the past. We can't experiment with history. It can only experiment by materials and conditions that are known today. And so I want to read something that is very clear. And this person said, the distinguished British biologist Woodger, who remarked some years ago, now find this, unstable organic compounds and chlorophyll corp corpuscles do not exist do not persist or come into existence in nature on their own account at the present day. And consequently, it is necessary to postulate that conditions were once so. 
that this did happen, although and in spite of the fact that our knowledge of nature does not give us any warrant for making such suppositions. It is simply dogmatism asserting what you want to believe did in fact happen. Folks, that's not science. That's not science. We know those things don't come into, and, and yet we're postulating and creating what we want to create. They gather what they want there, the gases, etc. Now, folks, that is not science at all. It is what man has drummed up and thought. And ironically, the scientist makes his biggest mistake as he presupposes intelligence, or you might say a creator. How is that? Because he assembles the elements that they would like to believe were there in the beginning. They believe there was no intelligence, yet they must set up their experiment. And so it must happen on its own, without guidance, or without any intelligent force. They have disqualified their experiment because it just must happen on its own. Furthermore, true science must be determined by repeatable tests. That's how we know it's true when they can repeat it. Yet no one can repeat the supposed beginning of the universe, and this proves that evolution is unscientific. Now, you know, in our books today, they call it the theory of evolution. But let me define what a theory is. We need to define theory. A theory is a proposition supported at least partially by observable facts. So according to that definition, evolution is not even a theory, but it is actually a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is something not proven, but assumed for the purpose of argument. It's a hypothesis. This is what we think might have happened, and we're going to create it. We can't really experiment with the, the proven things that are here today, and they don't exist, but we'll just postulate all this stuff, and we'll come up with it. That's phony. That is not science at all. And so as we continue on, not only is evolution not scientific, but it actually violates science that we know today. And this will blow your mind because these are established laws of science that are in our books that are known and believed and are true blue. And it violates these credible and established laws of science which are in our books. The first law of science that it violates is the law of biogenesis. That's a law. What is that law that is established and we know today? Some people, they view it as life begats life. That's biogenesis. Teaching that life does not originate from non-living matter, like rocks or like gases or like chemicals. Yet the evolutionists believe in spontaneous generation, which means that life spontaneously generated from non-living matter. That violates the law of biogenesis. Louis Pasteur won first place in the French Academy of Science in 1962 because his experimentation proved once and for all that living things are a product of living matter. That spontaneous generation has been proven to be false and unscientific, yet it's still being held by the evolutionists as a fact. Somehow, life spontaneously generated... Hold on, what about the law of biogenesis? Louis Pasteur proved, proved living things come from living matter. And the very probability of life creating itself is theoretically impossible by this statement from this individual. He said, if we begin with a very generous assumption about the beginning of life, then we assume that for a billion years the surface of the earth was covered each year, each year of a billion years, with a fresh layer one foot deep of protein molecules, this would be 260 trillion tons each year, a fantastic number of molecules, yet at the end of a billion years, the probability that 
just one protein molecule required to start life had been formed is only one chance in about a hundred billion. This means that it is really mathematically impossible for life to start by accident, even if the beginning would require a single suitable enzyme molecule. It's impossible. It's unprovable. Life did not spontaneously generate. And, and so we see that Louis Pasteur proved that. Well, another thing very similar to that, I don't know if you've given thought to this, but non-intelligence cannot give rise to intelligence. Where did our intelligence come from? What do I mean by that? Science cannot explain the intelligence or morals or purpose of man. Human beings have more than just flesh or material organs or tissue. We're not just flesh or tissue. <clears throat> We're not just a mammal, are we? Science cannot explain our inner being, our power of thought, our consciousness, our beliefs, our hopes, our aspirations, our values, our sensitivities, our compassion, how we delight and have deep appreciation in things like music or the arts. And actually, I really don't know why evolutionists try to prove evolution when they cannot explain how man has purpose. What is our purpose? God explains that to us. But what is our purpose? In essence, the evolutionists would take away our spirituality, take away our hope, and in turn leave us with no value of being, an empty hole or pit, and no future for our soul. We're just nothing. No rhyme or reason. If man is nothing more than an evolving organism or just a beast, then we have no rhyme or reason or sense of duty, and we live like an animal with absolutely no moral values. Why do we have moral values? No wonder the suicide rate is outrageous in our world today. People don't know a purpose to life, and that we have a, a, an end that will live on to eternity. In other words, after this life, our spirit will live on. So it's beyond the realm of science that is the compre comprehension of why we're here. Science can maybe say the water's boiling, but they cannot tell us why the water's boiling. We're here, but they cannot tell us why we're here. Science has named this mysterious question of why as metaphysics. Again, man can anticipate the future, seek for peace, reconciliation, have guilt, appreciation, virtues, feelings, compassion, all of these wonderful things that comprise us. It is unscientific to apply these attributes to the realm of science. They do not ex understand it or cannot explain it. But folks, it is not nature. It is not materialism, materialism or flesh. The Bible explains this as the being of our spiritual aspect to man. In other words, the heart of man, the soul of man, the inward man. We're comprised of heart and soul. And that explains who we are. And science cannot explain that. Intelligence. How does it give non-intelligence? How can it give rise to intelligence? But the law of thermodynamics. Have you heard of those laws? Those laws are real. They're real. They're true. They're as real as this big nose on my face. The laws of thermodynamics. And we first of all want to look at the first law of thermodynamics. And what does this first law state? The first law of thermodynamics, which was discovered by Robert Mayer, who lived in 1814 to 1878, states... Neither energy nor matter can be created or destroyed, but can only be converted from one form to another. The total amount of energy in the universe remains constant. That's what that law says. What's here has always been here, in other words. It's like a closed system. We live in a closed system. The Bible absolutely agrees with that. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3, it says that the works were finished from the foundation of the world. 
What's energy is here has always been here. According to this proven law, then it is impossible that the universe arose materialistically on its own. It is not possible because this law states that energy or matter cannot be created. The energy that is here is here, but cannot be created. And so this rules out the Big Bang or any theory that brings the universe out of nothing. We have a known law. And then they're violating that known law. And how do they violate? They have no scientific proof of that. It's not science. Evolution is not science. This rules out the Big Bang theory, doesn't it? It forbids the universe creating itself. If the universe cannot create itself, then we believe, as the Bible states, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But I want you to notice there's a second law to the law of thermodynamics, and that's this law. It's called the law of degeneration. This law states that energy is becoming less and less available for use, irrevocably lost to man, and therefore wasted, though not annihilated. For instance, if you take wood and you burn that wood, it goes up in smoke. That energy has been transposed to smoke, but but it's gone to, to uh, entropy. It's gone to, it's not able, it's degenerated. The energy is still there, but it's in a non-useful form. So simply stated, the second law of ther thermodynamics predicts that a system that is left to itself will in the course of time go towards greater disorder. Let's say we left this building, this is a nice building, and we just all just went somewhere else and abandoned it for 200 years. Guess what? We came back and it would be the Taj Mahal, wouldn't it? Would this building become the Taj Mahal? No, it would dilapidate. It would, be, it would eventually fall down because things go that way toward what they call entropy. And so the universe is growing old and wearing out and running down an ever decreasing supply of usable energy. And this is exactly what God's word says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10. Look at Hebrews 1 and verse 10. It says, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Lewis verse 11, they will perish, but you remain they will grow old as a garment. God created this world to run down. Eventually its resources, for instance, the Bible says in Romans 8.20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. We're studying that in Ecclesiastes, aren't we? That all these things that we build, this house that we pay such attention to, it's gradually going to become an old house. And someone's going to eventually bulldoze it down to build something better because it runs down. God's word says that. Wood rots. Metal rusts. Flesh decays. These resources go to waste. That's a proven law of thermodynamics, the second law. How does this contradict evolution? Evolution teaches that the universe is evolving, developing, and becoming more organized and complex, the complete opposite of the true law of science. We've been duped. Evolution is not science. It's contrary to all of these established laws of science that we know today. Therefore, evolution fails Another credible law of science. Well, this one really gets me, and I think it's really powerful. Another established law, as clear again as the nose on my face. Maybe I should say that pimple that I got the other day I can't get rid of. But I'll tell you what, this is an established law, and that is Mendel's law of heredity. Mendel had a law which he realized was true, and that's called the law of fixity of kind. Fixity of kind. 
Mendel proved that offspring inherit, produce, and exhibit the characteristics of parents according to dominant and recessive characteristics. Simply stated, Mendel's law states that all living things perpetuate their own likeness through offspring. In other words, their own kind. Just again, as the Bible states in Genesis 6, verse 20, it says of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Mendel proved scientifically that each kind has a different number of chromosomes and cannot be intermated. It is impossible for one kind to cross over and form another kind. That's the general theory of evolution. It violates Mendel's law of heredity, which is a proven law of science. Kinds do not grow out of a common ancestor. Mendel's law of heredity has proven that impossible. And so, you know, the scientist gathers all these fruit flies and the scientist radiates them. I want a different kind. I want to see what I can do to form something other than a fruit fly. They keep radiating them, mutating them, and all they get out of that is a deformed fruit fly. And you know what? They get a deformed fruit fly, which are mutations of errors in their DNA. And with those errors, they cannot order anything or make anything more complex. In other words, they'll just die out. Finally, evolution is unscientific because the survival of the organism is biologically impossible. With all those changes, it would be in violation. It couldn't survive. The evolutionists claim that the reptile evolved into birds, yet reptile lungs have millions of tiny air sacs, as do mammal lungs, but birds, bird lungs, have tubes rather than sacs. How can a creature with, half, with lungs half of sacs and half of tubes survive? It just couldn't survive. They say amphibians, or water land uh, animals, evolved into reptiles. However, I ask, how could the gelatous, simple amphibian egg designed to develop in water be transformed by slow changes to the complex amniotic egg of reptiles designed to incubate in the air? How could that egg survive? It cannot survive. And so I have some other charts that I want you to think about, and I want you to look at this. And you, you explain to me the answer in here. If the theory of evolution were true, and we have millions of these human beings, and we have mu millions of these, eight, these, these monkeys, and so we have the full monkey, and we have the human being, and the monkeys in existence, the human beings in existence, well, why aren't the missing links in existence? Where are the millions of these, the, the in-between supposed species? These transitioning creatures, where, is, where are they? The monkeys are here. Why don't we have all these different states? They should be here. And so it's kind of weird, isn't it? Where are they? And they're not even in the fossil record. I'll tell you where they are. They're drummed up in the mind of the evolutionists. That's what they are. And so I have this characteristic thing here, and that is, where did the Hildenburg man come from? If you can read that, I'll read it for you. It says, it was built from a jawbone that was conceded by many to be quite human. And yet they put all that tissue on him and came up with this Hildenburg man. Where did the Nebraska man come from? Scientifically built up from one tooth and later found to be the tooth of an extinct pig. Where did the Piltdown man come from? The jawbone turned out to belong to a modern ape and they just developed it into what they wanted to. Where did the Peking man come from? 500,000 years ago, 
all evidence of that has even disappeared. We, we don't even have that Piltdown Man evidence anymore. Where did the Neanderthal man? You know, I've been doing this mentoring uh, with some adolescent kids, and the one kid came out of class, and I didn't realize that. What? That the Neanderthal man was a homo sapien. That's what they're teaching, that this man. But really, in actuality, at the International Congress of Zoology, it said his examina examination showed that the famous Neanderthal, that skeleton was found in France over 50 years ago, is that of an old man who suffered from arthritis. There's your, there's your missing link. We've come up with that. How about the Cro-Magnon man? One of the earliest and best stated fossils is at least equal in physical, physique, and brain capacity to modern man. So what's the difference? It's just the modern man, and they wanted to put him like that, right? And so after establishing all that, this modern man, this genius, thinks we came from a monkey. Professing themselves to be wise, they have become fools. Exactly fitting in Romans chapter 1 and verse 22 as we read. I want to close on this note, and that's this. You know, as we look at all of these things and we have to say, why, why, why are people believing this? Why are people believing in evolution? And I'll tell you why. Why millions of people believe in evolution as a scientific fact. And that is because they've been taught it as a scientific fact. If a scientist tells you so, then you must say, I'm a dummy. I don't know. So I believe what you tell me. Right? Right? I'm going to accept what you say. It must be a law of science because the science teacher is telling you so. So if the scientist says that evolution is science, then it's so. But this thinking, and we as common people, we swallow it, swallow the unprovable, swallow the unscientific belief, and you know what we can call that? The scientific clout. That's what it is. The scientific clout and community. In other words, I knew a fellow named David Aiken. He was a Christian. He went through to become a scientist, and they told him in their school of thought and in the, at that level, they said, you cannot be a scientist and believe in evolution. Or, or, and not believe in evolution. You can't, cannot be. And that David Aiken did his thesis to become a doctor by saying there's an alternative to all of your so-called, you know, human beings, why we have the same extremities, why we have eyes, the same eyes, because our maker created us that way. So we would be able to use pig valves and things like that, so that we'd be able to study animals that move to help human beings, that God just designed us in similarity. That doesn't mean that we evolved. It just means God created us in similarity. And that is a purpose there. The scientific club. People simply follow the men and the philosophy rather than what is true, and that is the real scientific evidence. Am I going to follow the evolutionist when he has not proven a thing? No, not me. I'm not. I'm not going to be duped for that. In fact, I'll give you a good explanation. The earth was once scientifically accepted as... Flat. In its day, the scientists said so. It was accepted dogma in that day, but there was no proof. It was believed by the science, the scientists, and sadly to say, they let us down. But you know what doesn't let us down? God's word. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, God's word said, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. I want you to look closely at Darwin's own words. He has in his book, The Origin, entitled this section, Natural Selection. 
Darwin uses himself the language of speculation and imagination and assumption at least 187 times. For example, on pages 118 and 119, he uses the phrase, it may have been, uh, is supposed to, perhaps, if we suppose, may still be, uh, we have only to suppose, as I believe, it is probable, I have assumed, our suppose will generally uh, trend, may, will generally trend, if, if we assume, supposedly, supposed, probably. It seems, therefore, extremely probable, and we may suppose, now, is this really the language of science? No, it's not at all the language of science at all, is it? Another person, when he, Darwin was writing his, uh, one of his critics, Hubert Spencer, in February 23, 1960, said of him, of my numerous critics, you are almost the only one who has put the f philosophy of the argument, as it seems to me, in a fair way, namely, as an hypothesis with some innate probability, as it seems to me, which explains several groups of facts. Darwin even spoke that it's not fact, it's not true, it's a supposition. But you know what, with all that being read, the sad thing is this is not the way evolution is represented today. It is taught to our children as the truth and nothing but the truth. It is taught as a fact. Now I want to ask you, who is living by more faith or fact? Evolutionists have proven absolutely nothing by science, and I have even proven them guilty of violating the known credible laws of science. Yet the Bible is consistent with the true laws of science. They have accused believers in creation by God, as recorded in the Bible, as having only faith and that they have the science. What a lie that is. I want to suggest to them that they are the ones that are living more by faith and blind faith at that. They simply believe and even contrary to the laws of science today and now they are, folks, entitled to their belief. Although wrong, they are entitled to their belief, right? But where the line is crossed is when they proclaim evolution as scientifically proven and when they ramrod it down our children's throats in school as if to say, in other words, the test given and the earth is several hundred million years old, fact or opinion, and if someone says opinion, they will mark that wrong and say it is fact. There's no proof of that at all. They ramrod it down our throats, and the end result is they have fabricated a story, a story that cannot even stand the test of science. We want to close with an invitation, you know, when we look out at this world, this massive world, the universe, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We get goose pimples just thinking about how wonderful, masterful, everything is designed perfectly. The distance of the sun, the way the moon is. The, the, it, it's perfect for life on earth. Everything is designed. A watch just doesn't come into existence on its own, and this world certainly didn't, and design demands a designer. And so that's why we turn to these powerful verses in Romans 1 verse 19, because of what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible, invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What does man come up with? Idols. And remember what it says in the Old Testament, they used to cut, cut the wood in half and make an idol out of one and burn the other in the, uh, to warm up their food. Man creates an idol. I'd rather have a living and powerful God that the Bible talks about. And so as we close, you know, God invites all people 
to come to him. God, as we talked about earlier, sent his son from heaven to be a savior of mankind. We have the whole purpose of man in the Bible laid out from Genesis all the way through. And so in Acts 17, in verse 29, beginning, it says, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all, by raising him from the dead. Why don't we come to this true and living God, all powerful, masterful God, our designer, our maker? Listen, what else are you going to turn to? Are you going to turn to this? Do you really want to turn to that and say, Our Father is a monkey? Totally absurd. It's one or the other, really. What else do you have, you know? I believe in God who gave us the Bible and explains our purpose and mission to follow him so that we can have eternal life. If you're subject to the invitation, we'd invite you to come. Well, together we stand and while we sing.